whoever you are in Formula One, there are lots of other people there who are just as good as you are, whose sole object in life is to destroy you. We are at war in that we're fighting for just one unique prize. It's a non-stop fight. You need to have the best car, you need to have the best engineer, the best everything. If you don't have everything, you don't win. This is an industry which is absurdly and obscenely awash with money. It's not a prerequisite to be socially maladjusted to be a success in Formula One, but it probably gives you the edge over the next man. Each year, 11 Formula One teams contest 17 races across five continents. This sport is a $3 billion a year industry. The competition is ferocious. The world's best engineers fight for an advantage that can be measured in just thousandths of a second. Formula One cars are designed and built to the limits of technology technology that is as secret as the most advanced military projects. Formula One star drivers are global celebrities. The teams exploit their high profile to attract massive corporate sponsorship. The money they bring in gets devoured by the need to improve the cars from week to week. In this relentlessly competitive environment, nobody can afford to stand still. British teams have dominated Formula One for the last 40 years. The Italian Ferrari team is the only other to have any sustained success. The intensity of Formula One is pretty close to warfare, technical warfare certainly, and the British mentality is better at Formula One than any other country in Europe. And that may very well be politically incorrect, but it's an absolute categorical quantifiable fact we just do it better but British teams haven't always done it better no team can win Grand Prix races without discipline money and attention to detail this harsh lesson was handed out by the great German teams of the 1930s they brought professionalism to a sport that had previously attracted gentlemen amateurs the silver arrows of Mercedes-Benz were the pride of Hitler's Germany. Hitler was obsessed with demonstrating that the German nation was the best at everything, and he saw an opportunity to demonstrate how good German engineering, organization, and administration were by getting in on Grand Prix racing, as it was then, enabling Mercedes-Benz to produce extremely advanced motor cars by offering them considerable subsidies. I used to watch the Mercedes-Benz in 1937 and 38 uh, and yes it was gigantically spectacular it was noisy it was fast it was dramatic but it was not competitive I mean the, the Mercedes and Autiens would finish five minutes ahead of everybody else they were in a totally different league. These Mercedes-Benz W154s crushed the opposition of the 1938 Triple Grand Prix, powered by supercharged 3-litre V12 engines. The success of Mercedes-Benz depended on the organisational genius of this man. With his trilby hat and lounge suit, team manager Alfred Neubauer cut an unmistakable figure in the pit lane. During the First World War, he'd organized the Austrian Army's new motorized artillery units. With the Silver Arrows, he perfected a system of hand and flag signals, which allowed him to communicate information to his drivers during a race. I think every team in Formula One learned from what Mercedes did. 
they all really are very much like Mercedes were in the 30s, in, in that absolutely everything is accounted for, the risks are all reduced, everybody knows exactly their function. Uh, as, you, as you can tell from the pit stops, you know, which are so brilliantly organized now, Mercedes invented that uh, 70 years ago. Neubauer watched as Hermann Lang's huge car was refueled and made ready for new tires. One of today's Silver Arrows, a McLaren Mercedes, stands still for just over seven seconds. In 1938, it was all much slower. But with a lead of 13 minutes over the first of the Italian Alfa Romeos, Hermann Lang had time to spare. Even so, a rare mistake could have cost him the race, Wasser, Wasser. if not his life. Unfortunately for Mercedes-Benz and for the rest of Europe, Hitler's wider ambitions would put a halt to Grand Prix racing after the 1939 season but not before the Silver Arrows had set the benchmark. The question would be whether anyone could match up to their standards. Before the Second World War, German teams had dominated Grand Prix racing. Mercedes-Benz, led by team manager Alfred Neubauer, had set the standards of professionalism that define today's Formula One teams. After the Second World War, with Germany in ruins, the British motor industry decided to assume the dominant position that Mercedes-Benz had once occupied. The one and a half litre BRM is not just a new British racing motor, it's the product of the combined effort of more than 160 British manufacturing firms, no expense being spared. The plan is to restore British racing prestige all over the world, and it's hoped that the new BRM will be in action during 1950. The hugely ambitious BRM project was the brainchild of gentleman racer Raymond Mays. His inspiration came from Germany. As the war drew to a close, the Allies plundered Germany's technical expertise. While the Americans were employing German rocket scientists, the British decided to steal the German formula for Grand Prix success. In 1948, His Majesty's Stationery Office published a secret report, imaginatively entitled investigation into the development of German Grand Prix racing cars between 1934 and 1939. This would be the blueprint for the BRM. But the BRM would be a false start. Not surprisingly, it looked like a smaller version of the Mercedes W154, but with a 1.5-litre supercharged V16 engine, it was technically overcomplicated. To make matters worse, Raymond Mays was no Alfred Neubauer. The BRM project lacked focus and ultimately became a very public embarrassment. BRM was run by people who really didn't understand that the imperative is to win races. Technically, they had some wonderful ideas. They, they built this technologically hugely sophisticated car that just sadly never worked. The drama of the last-minute dash by air of the BRM car to enter for the international trophy race kept the big crowd at Silverstone in suspense up to the moment of starting. Alas for the hopes of its enthusiasts, the BRM failed to start owing to transmission trouble. A hundred thousand well wishers were sadly disappointed. Clearly, the British were bad at industry-sponsored motor racing. This would not be the way to win. 1954, Alfred Neubauer and his Mercedes-Benz team returned to Grand Prix racing. The Silver Arrows hadn't lost their secret ingredient. They were everything that BRM was not. Streamlined and ruthlessly efficient from the top down. The return of Mercedes-Benz was a symbol of hope for a new country, West Germany. Within just one season, the team again dominated motor racing. At the British Grand Prix in 1955, Mercedes-Benz took the first four places. Sterling Moss became the first Englishman to win his home race in the new era of Formula One. 
Neubauer's team again looked unstoppable. But once more, tragedy would end the team's dominance. Mercedes-Benz announced its withdrawal from all motorsport at the end of the season. Weeks earlier, the team had been stunned by the worst accident in the history of motor racing. At Le Mans' 24-hour sports car race, a Mercedes-Benz collided with a smaller car as it slowed into the pit lane. The Mercedes-Benz was sent flying into the crowd. More than 80 people were killed. Mercedes-Benz would not return to Grand Prix racing for more than 30 years. With the Germans gone, the Italians regained the dominant position they'd lost on Neubauer's return. Despite lacking the discipline of Mercedes-Benz, the Italians triumphed with brilliant lightweight engine designs. The center of the motor racing industry, manufacturer, in the 1950s was Italy. And the reason was because that's where Maserati were, that's where Ferrari were, that's where Alfa Romeo were. And um, the notion of motor racing manufacture then and design was about the engine. The engine was the magic of any racing car. If you had predicted in the early 50s that Britain, 10 years later, would be beginning to emerge as the centre of the motor racing industry, you would have thought that was a completely absurd prediction because at that point the industry was very weak in Britain and the centre of it was Italy. The Italians would continue to win concentrating their efforts on generating horsepower. So the British looked to new technologies. Britain was a great centre of the aircraft industry, and the strength of that industry, coupled with its precipitous decline, meant that there were a lot of guys around with skills that no other European country had at that time. Lots of aerodynamicists, and some of those guys went into motor racing. And this gave Britain an enormous advantage over Italy, where there was really no, uh, for example, aerospace uh, skill base in that way. What mattered was the chassis and the aerodynamics, and the engine became, for a whole era, relatively secondary. By the late 1960s, teams could buy reliable off-the-shelf engines from companies like Ford and gearboxes from Hewland. They reorganized these components so the engine was behind the driver. Their cars raced on disused World War II aerodromes. The great Enzo Ferrari derided the British teams with their new outlook, calling them garagistes, garage workers. British manufacturers built small, light cars, usually borrowing engines. They built these light chassis that would work on smooth aerodrome circuits, unlike the German and Italian cars before the war and French cars, which had raced, which were much more rugged and had raced on open roads. So we developed a new kind of racing car that was very, very suitable for the way that motor racing was going. So we, within 20 years of the end of the war, had absolutely the dominant influence on Formula One. The 1960s were the heyday of the British Garage East. That decade, the teams won eight Constructors' Championships. It was a very much more informal, not to say shambolic business, a much more amateur business, and you could get by as a hustler. You didn't have to enter two cars, you didn't have to build a car yourself. If you could buy an old car uh, and get hold of an engine and you'd got a driver, you could enter it and you'd scrape together the entry fee and you might do reasonably well. One of the hustlers who forced his way into Formula One was a used car salesman called Frank Williams. Unlike most aspiring young racers, he hadn't been born into family money. In 1969, he scraped together the cash to enter a single car into Formula One. I remember Frank Williams when his office was a telephone box. He hadn't got enough money to have a phone, and he would make 
calls to people and then he would wait outside the telephone box for them to call back. So Frank knows the value of money. His first driver was a personal friend, Old Etonian Piers Courage. Courage finished the 1969 season a respectable eighth in the Drivers' Championship. But the following year at the Dutch Grand Prix, disaster struck. Courage crashed. His car rolled over. He was trapped beneath it while it burned. Frank Williams was devastated by the loss of his friend. But he never gave up on his obsession. I'm a racer, I've always enjoyed it. It's all I ever really think of. I've been a driver, I've been a mechanic, I'm now an entrant. Um, I just enjoy it so much. It's part of my life, or it is my life, and I never have any difficulty in wanting to keep going, and I can't for the life of me imagine what else, ever else I would want to do anyway. Over the following seasons, he would struggle, fielding second-rate drivers in third-rate cars. He built a world championship winning Formula One team out of what I can only describe as pit lane debris in the 1970s. He's worked for everything that he's achieved. Nothing has been delivered to him on a plate. Frank, given his entrepreneurial instincts and his racer's instincts as well, thrived in that, in that environment. Um, obviously there were difficult years, living from hand to mouth. But in the late 1970s, Frank Williams' fortunes would dramatically improve. He knew that the Saudi royal family might be interested in sponsoring a Formula One team. He learned that the king's second son, Prince Mohammed, was staying in London. He dumped that year's car in the bus lane outside the prince's hotel. The prince took a liking to the teetotal Frank Williams. Albilad, the prince's personal trading company, became a major sponsor. Frank Williams' other piece of good fortune was meeting a young engineer called Patrick Head. Head's technical skill perfectly complemented Williams' entrepreneurial flair. The two of them came to form a unique partnership. I don't think I envisaged that designing race cars was an activity at which I could earn a useful living. I think I certainly had the idea that I wanted to work in motor racing, but I thought of it as an activity where I'd have to be scraping uh, shekels from one day to the other and I thought that it would be a limited time and that someday I'd have to go and get a proper job in engineering and design washing machines or something of productive use to mankind. Well until Patrick arrived I was kind of muddled along and never achieved any success. It's lots of failures that some people found rather funny, at least of all me, but um, it's, it's been a very enjoyable partnership I think on a personal level too. Um, we have a lot of some common interests uh, but the, the fundamental bond is this sport, is this Formula One. Head designed the FW07, the first successful Williams car. It was solid, reliable and totally pragmatic. Right now everyone is getting quicker and quicker. We've got to do the same. I've put two and a half more gallons in. You've got another seven or eight laps to go. In 1979, after more than 100 attempts, Frank Williams won his first Grand Prix. I don't know how many Grand Prix I participated in until that point, but I felt clearly very, uh, was, you know, very happy, but also rather very embarrassed how long it took to get there in the first place. It was a, it was a turning point in our fortunes. The team now is a world away from the struggling outfit that Frank Williams started in the late 60s. Back then, he financed his ambitions by selling used car parts. Now, he sells advertising space. Today, his team isn't at Silverstone to go racing, nor even for testing. They're here to shoot a commercial. Compaq, one of the team's major sponsors, has just merged with Hewlett Packard. Today, it's a secret. Tomorrow, the world will know. The cars are mobile advertising hoardings which command worldwide viewing figures of 
gigantic proportions, billions, billions with a B, billions of people watching it from March to November. F1 has two audiences. One basically doesn't matter very much and the other matters a lot. The one that doesn't matter very much is the one that goes to the races. The one that matters a lot is the television audience because that's what powers the money. And Formula One is about money, big, big money. 350 million television viewers watch each Grand Prix. There are 17 races each year. This global exposure makes space on the cars a hugely valuable commodity. And Frank Williams knows how to sell. I think probably for a man like Frank Williams, that's part of the fun, the deal making in a way, is another kind of competition. Nobody is better in Formula One uh, at selling space on the car to sponsors. It, the tops of the suspension arms on a Williams are sold to a sponsor. You know, he's the only one who, who does that. If you look at every other sport, there's enormous regulations, FIA Formula One type regulations, if you like, over the size of the logos they can have on a tennis shirt or the soccer, whatever it is, or golf being a good example. There's no way you can have a logo bigger than about that. And in Formula One, where there's enormous regulation of the, the technicalities of the car, when it comes to what the sponsors want to do, there's no regulation whatsoever. So we have enormous sizes that these sponsors can fill. And part of Formula One's management control, if you like, of the regulations is to ensure that there are still nice big flat surfaces on the car for these logos. A lot of cynics say that the cars are the way they are these days in terms of appearance. I say that there's a nice big wing on the back and a nice big engine cover so that there's plenty of room for the advertisers to put their logos and uh, signage on it. And I think in, in many ways they're, they're probably right. Uh, but I don't have any great quarrel with that. If it generates the money that people need to go motor racing for it to be the way it is now, which in my view is very good indeed, OK. Sponsorship money has transformed Formula One. It started with Colin Chapman, he shocked the sport in 1968. The traditional green and yellow livery of his Lotus team was replaced with the red, white and gold of a cigarette brand. Technology is expensive, so money had to be found from new sources, rather than the traditional source of the fuel, uh, and oil and tyre companies, who hitherto had been the general funders of Formula One. Money is the common denominator in all success in, in many businesses and certainly in the sport. Tobacco's billions would power Formula One throughout the 1970s and 80s. But now the party's over. Today seems like this a history. The teams recently bowed to government pressure and agreed to phase out all tobacco advertising by 2006. With his usual foresight, Frank Williams kicked the habit of a lifetime and gave up tobacco advertising before he was forced to. These days, he only deals with companies that can help him both financially and technically. Like all Formula One teams, Williams' finances are shrouded in secrecy. But it's thought that the team has an annual budget of $230 million. Half comes from BMW. Of BMW's contribution, $90 million comes in the form of 50 race engines, and 150 rebuilt engines. Hewlett Packard are thought to stump up $36 million, including a $1 million Alpha supercomputer. Allianz chip in with an estimated million dollars of insurance and $18 million in cash, while Castrol probably hand over half a million dollars of oil and throw eight million dollars into the kitty. Michelin chip in with more than four million dollars of tires, while Petrobras serve up two million dollars of free petrol each year, as well as handing over around three million dollars in loose change. But there's no drinking and driving. The German beer company Feltins is the exception, offering no liquid support. They simply write a check in the region of six million dollars. Before the cars became advertising hoardings, teams would race in their country's colours. 
the British in green, the Italians in red, and the Germans in silver. Grand Prix racing has been an outlet for national pride since before World War II. You can regard the German government as the original major sponsor of Grand Prix racing and now Formula One. And it is now the, the, the big sponsors who are doing with money what Hitler did, except that they are doing it for commercial reasons and he was doing it for national reasons. In the 21st century, European nations no longer go to war with one another. Today's wars are between multinational corporations and Formula One is on the front line. Bringing in the sponsorship is a vital battle, but the real war is fought behind closed doors in the secrecy of the team's headquarters. Deep in England's Oxfordshire countryside is this secret industrial complex. 450 people work here. Inside the Williams headquarters, some of the world's best engineers are busy spending nearly a quarter of a billion dollars of sponsorship money. A Formula One team will spend as much money as it can get. It can never get enough. But the sport is so technical these days that it requires vast amounts of money. The technicians work punishing hours to improve the car's lap times by a few hundredths of a second. In this environment, EU directives on working hours go out the window. Formula One is about hard work. It's about doing harder work than the guy next to you. You know, it's about Williams working harder than Ferrari. To get people that want to work in that environment, they, they find their way into the environment. It's very difficult to train people to, to want to do that. They come from, from racetracks all around the world in lower categories and they work their way into Formula One. There's no time for socialising. It's flat out from dawn till dusk, and that's what wins your Grand Prix. That sort of horrifying level of commitment and intensity is what makes you better than the next man, I'm afraid, in this business. It's 6.30 in the morning, but this car has already done several laps of Hockenheim in preparation for next week's German Grand Prix. It's being run on a four-poster rig the rig works off data that was recorded when a Williams previously did a test lap of the track in Germany. This data allows the engineer to subject the car to exactly the same bumping and jarring that it will experience when it returns to race. We normally put the current car on the rig the week leading up to a race, so on the Monday we would have a car on the rig with the data available for that track and we would then start um, a sort of two or three day test program. In the secrecy of the lab, the engineers can modify the dampers to fine tune the car's suspension. It's very important to optimise the damping on the car um, to minimise tyre wear, to optimise the aerodynamics of the car to make sure the car is always in the correct attitude to, to get the maximum out of the aerodynamics and also to give the driver confidence in the handling. Getting this right in Oxfordshire will save precious practice time over the race weekend. A four-poster rig costs nearly a million dollars. No Formula One team can seriously compete without one. A successful team also needs a Steve Berry he makes exhaust pipes. He's done nothing else for the last 14 years. Each set costs $18,000. This is where the sponsorship money goes. And Steve Berry knows why. Everybody remembers the winner. They don't remember who comes second or who comes third. In our company, the exhausts are classified as a, a Class A component. Uh, that means that if they break, it's a potential race-stopping occurrence. So we do our utmost to make sure that they don't break. The best way to make sure they don't break is to make them out of Inconel. It's a nickel-chromium alloy that was originally developed by Rolls-Royce for jet engines. 
The exhausts are designed to work at temperatures up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. When the engine is idling, they glow red. At full throttle, they're translucent. The material is only light because it's thin. It's a bitch of a material to work with. Because it's so tough, if you hit it, it will just come back to where it started. You try and bend it and you cut through the tube, it goes oval. You've got all sorts of problems on your hands to just work in the material. But if they haven't got my bit, they couldn't go racing. British teams could never have triumphed without people like Steve Berry. Skilled artisans working with materials and ideas borrowed from the aviation industry have been the backbone of British success. Technical director Patrick Head has rooted the Williams team in this garagiste culture. I think Williams has been successful over such a long period because basically Frank and Patrick are racers. They are creatures of motor racing. They both came up when British motor racing was a pretty primitive sort of affair and they got their hands dirty uh, and they know it from the ground up and they've never lost their appetite for racing. Patrick's the best technical director in Formula One for the last 25 years, not by a little bit but by miles because he's very focused on good engineering and it hurts him when they're not quickest, it, you know, it, it's physical with Patrick. Williams is it's an engineering company. It was not called Williams Grand Prix Engineering by accident. The main thing about Williams is the engineering. I think Williams has always been very strongly engineering-led and has always put engineering and the quality of its cars as the, the top and most important thing. And providing it doesn't make the engineers big-headed and get above themselves, I think it's quite good. The pace of Formula One is frenetic. Patrick Head's engineers have to improve the car every day or risk being left behind. Fundamentally, Formula One is an R&D exercise. Um, we're not in the business of producing tens or hundreds of motor cars. We're in the business of producing one prototype and making it better and better every day, every week, every year. When a component is no longer cutting edge, it's instantly obsolete. There's no limit to how much effort can go into manufacturing the smallest part. The result is that each year 450 Williams employees make just eight cars. In fact, the team doesn't make eight whole cars. Williams produce the vast majority of the components. But BMW provide a three-litre V10 engine. The brake pads and discs come from carbon industry. And the brake calipers and clutch from AP Racing. The wheels come from OZ, while the most secret and most important element comes from Michelin, the tyres. Formula One teams go to extraordinary lengths to produce the most competitive cars possible, but this key element is largely beyond their control. They don't even get to fit the tyres to the wheels. The tyre companies send their own staff to each race. The technology in a Formula One tyre is as advanced as any other component in the car. On a typical lap, the tyres revolve up to 50 times each second. Going round corners, they can experience lateral forces of 3.5 G. When the driver hits the brakes, they decelerate the car from just under 300 kilometres an hour to 80 kilometers an hour in just two seconds. The companies that know how to make a Formula One tire jealously guard their knowledge. The tire is actually number one. A better set of tires can give you a two second advantage, which is light years in Formula One when they're struggling to gain a tenth of a second with a more powerful engine or better aerodynamics. Tyres are so crucial because they're the bit of the car that touches the ground. They're entirely responsible for the transfer of all that technology on the car, all, that, all the things that make the power or the braking uh, capacity of the car have an effect. Tyres can determine a team's entire race strategy. 
the tyre has got to last at least a third of the race on a two-stop strategy, half the race if it's a one-stop strategy. So what tyre manufacturers in Formula One are struggling for all the time is a tyre which gives the greatest grip and the longest life, and those two things are incompatible. So they've got to get the best possible compromise. The tyre with the most grip is a completely smooth one, known as a slick. It provides the most grip because it has the greatest surface area of rubber in contact with the ground. It's banned. The treads on wet weather tyres disperse water, but serve no purpose in dry conditions. Now slicks are banned, tyres must have four grooves, reducing their contact area with the road. Tyres work best at around 100 degrees Celsius, about the temperature of a freshly baked pizza. Tire warmers, removed at the last possible moment, keep them hot and sticky. Tires are often described as the black art of Formula One. Whatever the conditions, dry or wet, their importance can hardly be overstated. As far as Frank Williams is concerned, getting the right tires is at least as important as signing a star driver. Drivers, well, they're one of the four main performance requirements of a racing car. There's horsepower, there's the car, the aerodynamics of the car in particular, there is the driver and there is the tyre. So he's 25% of the whole, if you wish. He is very important, and the fees driver's command uh, emphasises that. Drivers to Williams are employees, highly paid, talented employees, but ultimately there to do a job, and if they don't deliver, they very rightly get quite a hard time. Racing drivers are big boys, they know what they're getting involved in, and if they come to the Williams team, they needn't expect any psychological life support systems out of the car, because they're not going to get them. Drivers don't always find this attitude to their liking. More than once, Williams have allowed champion drivers to leave when their wage demands became excessive. In a sport typified by huge salaries and egos to match, there's nothing like a spell at Williams to bring a driver down to earth. Williams, Patrick Head and Frank Williams. So if they hired Michael Schumacher, they would be hiring him as a racing driver. And they would not really want Michael to come in and say, I think we should have this engineer and this mechanic and I don't want to work with this guy. And, you know, they'd say, Michael, go away, let us do the job. Come, you know, see you at the next test session. It's a tough relationship. I repeat, they're very highly paid. They're great sportsmen and indeed champions, uh, many of them. And we expect almost perfection from them. Sometimes a little unforgivingly, but... Maybe that's a mistake, maybe it's a, a plus point. Frank Williams is a frustrated racing driver. Uh, he would have admitted that 20 years ago. And the fact that he's got that innate competitiveness drives him to this very day. He is the ultimate racer's racer. Frank Williams' frustrated ambitions nearly cost him his life. In March 1986, he attended a test session at the Paul Ricard circuit in the south of France. Afterwards, he set off in his hire car for Nice Airport. He drove too fast. The car took off, then landed nose down into, into a field, nose down, and um, somersaulted and came down upside down. And very sadly, the first impact when it came down was on Frank, more on Frank's side than on mine and the roof caved in, and he took a direct blow basically on the top of his head, which basically moved the fourth and fifth vertebra sideways and crushed the, uh, the spinal cord. And both of us were wearing belts. Neither of us had any other injury. I had no injuries at all, apart from bruising, and he had no other injuries, no other broken bones at all. It was just that direct blow on the head that did it, and the car was upside down. And in the end, I think an ambulance got there about 50 minutes later, but it was 50 minutes of me with Frank, and Frank being very logical and very calm in the way he was speaking and not panicking at any stage, talking about various things that he wanted done and, and this and that. And it was, um, you know, it was very typical, really, of a Formula One person in a crisis, very calm, very logical. Frank Williams very nearly died, not in a racing car, but in a hire car. The last rites were read to him by the side of the road. He survived, but was left permanently paralysed. 
I think I was still young enough and Frank was probably still young enough where basically we thought we were indestructible and um, as one does when one's younger we weren't young but we were certainly a lot younger um, and the thought of Frank not running around in his running shorts and being physically very uh, a very dominant force in the team just hadn't occurred to me I think we felt it was very important to keep you know that Williams wouldn't collapse I think for our own pride that year we wanted to show that we could keep the show on the road and that we could do a very good job and as it was we won nine races in that year I think we won the constructors championship very easily but we wanted to uh, uh, show that Williams was just stronger than the presence of one man, albeit that that one man in effect embodied the personality and the style of the team. A year after breaking his neck, Frank Williams was back at work. In 1987, his first season back, his team won both the Constructors' and the Drivers' Championship. Frank Williams is Formula One in many ways. There's no dwelling on past successes. Tomorrow's the most important thing in his life and always has been, and the next race after that. He is totally committed. The year Frank Williams returned after his accident, something else happened that in the long run had an even greater impact on Formula One. Bernie Eccleston, another used car salesman and friend of Frank Williams, became the vice president in charge of promotional affairs for the sport's governing body the FIA. Soon, he'd become the most powerful man in the history of Formula One, and one of the richest men in Britain. Formula One is a never-ending battle for supremacy. The teams compete to get the most sponsorship, the best technology, the most championship points. And yet they're bound together by mutual self-interest. Their war, skillfully marketed, has made a lot of people extremely rich. There are more millionaires per square yard in a Formula One paddock than anywhere else in the world. It's not easy to gatecrash the party. It's basically been the same guys running it for the last 20, 25 years, and they've got a system, and they've got a cake, and they've got the cake sliced up in, in nice segments, and they really go out of their way to make sure that those segments don't get any smaller and that the cake remains as large and as rich as they can possibly make it. You know, it's not a democracy. Um, it's a community, but it's not a democracy. Uh, it's, uh, and the guy who really um, runs the sport is Bernie. It will now come Let's get all the cars back into the pits and change tyres. All the cars back into the pits and change the tyres. Come on. Formula One is run by one of the world's greatest salesmen, Bernie Eccleston, um, who started off selling second-hand motorbikes and, and motor cars and has become such a fabulously rich man. I think a lot of people are intimidated by Bernie, there's no doubt about that, and I think that's how he's got his way. Well, luck you've got a discount because everyone gets good and bad luck. It's like playing roulette, you know? That's so I think you need to throw that away. Because... Soon after he bought the Brabham team in 1971, Bernie Eccleston became secretary of the Formula One Constructors Association known as FOCA. The organisation had been set up to represent the British garagists. Eccleston bound the teams together against the bargaining power of the Continental Works teams. He is a man of great vision and when he arrived in Formula One by buying the Brabham team in 1971 he quickly realised that it was not poorly run, it just wasn't run. But Bernard had, does have total control he has been so successful because he is very demanding. You could criticize his desire for total control. Whether we like it or not, whether it's good or bad, it does seem to work, and I think it'll carry on for some time like that. Of course, he's had his pound of flesh and more for that achievement. I mean, he's made himself super rich, as only a kind of monopolist can, which is exactly what he's been. But he understood very early on that... Uh, uh, the teams to get their share of the money needed to act together. In 1978, he became chief executive of FOCA. Three years later, after a turf war with the governing FIA, he gained the right to negotiate TV contracts. He tightened his grip on the sport in 1987 by becoming an FIA vice president. He recently secured the commercial rights to Formula One for the next 100 years. He shares the spoils with the team bosses, 
Exactly how the cake gets carved up is highly secret. Now, Bernie Eccleston's entrepreneurial genius has enticed the world's most powerful companies onto his merry-go-round of money, publicity, and cutting-edge technology. Having succeeded in turning Formula One into a truly global product, he might have endangered the British garagist culture that he set out to protect. Nothing is forever. And uh, I think that you can already see uh, Britain's dominance which at one stage was overwhelming, beginning to erode. What's happened now is that big manufacturers, car manufacturers, have moved into Formula One in a big way. BMW is one of the biggest. The Bavarian giant joined forces with Williams in 1998. The company's five-year commitment to Formula One won't leave it much change from a billion dollars. Having made that kind of investment, the chances are that BMW will want to follow its rival, Mercedes, and buy a permanent stake in a top Formula One team. The centre of gravity is no longer in Britain like it used to be. And the money, which is coming from the big manufacturers, is in a sense dragging it geographically slowly to other places, to France, to Germany, to Japan. It's, it's not a natural situation, the uh, position of cars being produced in England and I would say it's quite heavily under threat at the moment. Nobody should sit comfortably thinking that Formula One uh, exists in England and, and that we're the best at it. I think that maybe what we should reflect on is that that period from 1960 to let's say 2000 was a very exceptional period where Britain, this small area of Britain was responsible for sort of 90 percent of motor racing cars and that that era is now being eroded that era is over and it's shifting to other places how quickly and so on well who knows that's a question that one can only speculate about For over 50 years, Formula One has been two contests. One between the drivers on the track and the other between the Formula One rule makers and the engineers who design and build the cars. Because of this, Formula One is the most technologically advanced sport in the world. Its engineering is more aeroplane than automobile. The rules are the formula. They define everything. Size of tires, chassis dimensions, type of engine, even track safety. Formula One, like a game of chess played at 300 kilometers an hour. This Formula One car was built by Williams Grand Prix Engineering in 1993. It's called an FW15. Alain Prost won the World Drivers Championship in it. Underneath its carbon fiber skin is a treasure trove of computer-controlled hydraulic hardware. The FW15 had traction control, electronic engine management, a computer-controlled semi-automatic gearbox, and active suspension. 
Without electronics, the car would have been impossible to drive. It remains the most technologically advanced racing car ever built. We were adding such a high degree of complexity to the car with all of the suspension electronically controlled, um, but in immense power that the engineer could then have to literally fly this low-flying aircraft uh, at any attitude he wanted, make it roll compensate, roll into the corners instead of rolling out all sorts of uh, powers we had. The car was so advanced technically, in many ways it's the most advanced racing car that's ever been built technically because a lot of the things that it had were banned subsequently. The FW15 was banned at the end of the 1993 season. Formula One's rule makers, the FIA, were concerned about three aspects of this generation of Formula One cars. Track speed had become dangerously high. The software within the cars was impossible to police and the electronics created a perception that Formula One cars were removing driver skill. Part of what Formula One is about is understanding how good drivers are and demonstrating driver skill and those things really took some of that away so they should go. And they really were saying Formula One is uh, a different thing to road cars. But road cars are increasingly important to Formula One. The big car manufacturers are moving in in the hope that the technical glamour of racing will rub off on their products. Williams driver Juan Pablo Montoya and test driver Mark Genet are at Valencia's racing circuit to thrill the guests of one of Williams' biggest sponsors. They'll do this in a road car stuffed with electronic driver aids to make it easier to control. But they'll turn off the most vital driver aid, stability or traction control. With the traction control turned off, the handling of the cars is now down to driver skill. They can perform manoeuvres impossible with the electronics fully engaged. When Montoya steals back the drive from the computer like this, he is taking a technological step backwards. Another racetrack, Silverstone, England. This is what Montoya calls his office. A Formula One car is a different species from a road car. It has no doors, and to save weight, it doesn't even have a built-in starter motor. When the engine starts, it idles at the same speed as the rest of us drive at. In comparison with the road car that Montoya drove at Valencia, it has few electronic aids. The aids that are allowed on Formula One cars have been banned, reinstated, modified, curtailed and sometimes simply hidden from the scrutineers. Clever engineers are always trying to outwit the men who write the rules or formula. The big problem that late 20th century Formula One racing got itself into was that the cars were getting more and more clever. And the danger was that the driver was going to play a smaller and smaller part in winning the race. And that's not good box office. If the drivers are the box office heroes, they are increasingly in the hands of the team's engineers. Engineers can now control not just what he drives, but how he drives it. Spectators who switch on to watch the drivers battle on the track are at the very heart of Formula One. Without spectators, sponsors would not bother to buy the space on the cars. Without the money from the sponsors, the teams cannot fund the technology that threatens to alienate the spectators. But without the technology, it isn't Formula One. This unique contradiction is in constant danger of destroying the sport. The problem first arose in 1977, when an apparently invisible secret advantage made two cars unbeatable.
since the late 70s, Formula One cars have looked less like cars and more like aircraft. Instead of the cigar-shaped, streamlined racers of previous eras, these cars of the new era evolved into extraordinary pieces of secret technology. The first were the sinister black Lotus 78 cars, designed by Colin Chapman. They hid a secret that few at the time understood. The Williams FW24 is a direct descendant of the Lotus 78. Its layout is universally accepted as the perfect solution for a single seat racer. The 10 cylinder engine is low down in the middle. Either side of the cockpit are cooling ducts. Behind these are radiators for the engine. There are no fans to move the air when the car is stationary. The semi-automatic gearbox is bolted onto the back of the engine. It supports all the suspension and final drive to the rear wheels. Tucked between the engine and the driver is a self-sealing bag holding about 100 litres of fuel. The car's bodywork is entirely aerodynamic, moulded from carbon fibre composites. A rear-wheel drive road car's layout has not changed since the 1930s. The body is a steel shell called a monocoque. The engine is mounted between the wheels at the front. Ahead of the engine is the radiator. Fans keep it cool when the car is stationary. Bolted behind the engine is a gearbox. A propeller shaft from the gearbox takes the power through a differential to the drive shafts for the rear wheels. A steel or plastic fuel tank is fitted under the rear seats. The driver sits upright and to one side. And to make driving easier, any amount of technology can be added to the basic package. At one time, road cars benefited from racing. Tires, brakes, steering, engines, all were refined on the track. With the arrival of computers, an invisible revolution has overtaken the building and driving of cars. Super saloons like this have traction control, stability control, anti-lock brakes, active suspension, electronic gear selection, and even a memory of who is driving it. But most of this did not come from Formula One. Nobody in Formula One has said with a straight face for some years that motorsport improves the breed of road cars. Most of what is on a Formula One car is of no interest for road cars, but is of great interest to engineers. Frank Durney is an engineer, an aerodynamicist. By blowing over the top surface of a sheet of paper, he is demonstrating a scientific fact. When air speeds up over a surface, its pressure drops. The paper is sucked up into the air. An aeroplane wing uses this principle to get lift and to fly. This was the secret that engineers at Lotus had stumbled on. Hidden under the black bodywork of the car was a primitive upside-down wing shape. Rubber skirts running close to the road were the only clue to the physics going on behind them. As the car raced forward, stationary air was forced under the car and accelerated by the wing shape. As the air speeded up, the pressure dropped, sticking the car to the road. The skirts were an attempt to seal the low pressure from the outside air. Lotus produced a car which is just beating all of us. 
And obviously it had got some particular technical feature that really was a big step forward, and we didn't really know what it was. And, so, and Lotus were very good at putting out smoke screens. The big one was they'd invented a fantastic new differential. And every time the car was worked on, they would put a cover over the gearbox, and somebody would go scuttling into the truck with a, a piece of cloth covering some device. And so everyone's eye was taken off the ball, because what they'd actually done was discovered a way of getting about three times more downforce without any more drag, which gave them the grip and frankly the differential couldn't even if it was perfect have made as much difference as we were being hoodwinked into trying to believe in the end it became perfectly clear by making a wind tunnel model that ground effect was just a huge step forward Frank Durney helped perfect what Lotus had discovered the 1979 FW07 had a better wing shape but Derny also realised that the air constantly leaking into the underside and destroying the suction could be cured by having a sliding skirt. The skirt on the Williams wasn't flexible. It was stiff and moved up and down in a slot in the side pod, sealing the car to the road at all times. The performance advantage was a revelation. Skirts were banned in 1981. From then on, any aerodynamic advantages had to be hunted down on every square centimetre on the car's surface. Well, the first thing that hits the air is the front wing, and the front wing is simply an upside-down aeroplane wing. These big end plates on here are to, to reduce the fact that the low pressure underneath the car will, uh, will be sucking air in, and the less air you suck in, the more downforce you retain. These bits here are for picking up air to cool the brakes, if you don't keep the brakes cool, the car reliability is destroyed, and it's very important, but unfortunately, it's very easy for the flow around these to flow inwards and disturb the side pod flow or the rear wing flow. And that it's surprising how important the brake duct shape is. The engine has to be fed with air. This is a turbocharged car, so it's got cooling air and air to keep the uh, compressed turbocharged air cool. And there's a minimum amount of air that needs to go through there. Every extra bit of air that you let go through there produces extra drag and takes momentum out of the airstream, which means that it isn't there to produce extra downforce. So as an aerodynamicist, you run the engine as hot as the engine manufacturers will let you, because that will give you the best aerodynamic performance. Round here, you have the problem of letting all the hot air out from the engine, from the radiators, and still maintaining good downforce from the wing. And so everything ahead of this rear is all orientated about not upsetting the flow here. So the outline of a Formula One car is scientific, not cosmetic. Even without skirts and a regulation flat bottom instead of a wing shape, aerodynamicists can still get some downforce from under the car. The front wings, hitting clean air, are adjusted to force the front of the car down this aids grip, particularly when cornering. The body of the car is contoured to keep air attached to it. The better this is done, the better the rear wings will work. Downforce over the rear wheels helps give all important grip. In a good car, all these elements work in perfect harmony. In a bad car, they don't. The problem with getting downforce from wings on top of the car is drag. Drag is turbulent air sucked along behind the car. Air has weight, and because the drag is reluctant to let go, it can be like towing a caravan at 250 kilometers an hour. If the downforce is generated from the wing at the back of the car, then with it, it brings extra drag, and then depending on the speed of the car, that uh, requires additional horsepower to overcome that extra drag. So if you have a horsepower advantage, you can use some of it to run a bit more aerodynamic downforce on the car and inevitably a bit more drag, while still maintaining just enough to make sure that you're a few kilometres an hour quicker than your opposition. So having a more powerful engine is definitely an advantage. During the 1980s, Formula One cars had engines half the size of today's cars. But they were turbocharged. Turbos produced huge amounts of power, wings or no wings, 
they were much too fast. They were banned. Turbos had used complex electronic engine management computers to keep the engines from exploding. With the turbos gone, engineers would find other things to do with the computers. The focus could now move back to the secret underside of the car. By 1992, Formula One engineers had realized that computers could revolutionize the car's handling. Better still, there were no rules governing their use. Digital electronic computers can process enormous amounts of information at very high speeds. They are perfect for stabilizing unstable machines. The Eurofighter is an unstable machine. A plane designed in the Cold War era for combat. It is built around three supercomputers. The pilot flies the computers and the computers fly the plane. The computers were not there, the pilot could not fly this airplane. There is no manual backup. So if you like, we are reliant upon the computers, but happy to be so because of the benefits they give us. The benefits are that the pilot doesn't have to worry about making turns or loops that would crash the plane or tear it apart. The computer constantly assesses what the pilot has done, processes information about the attitude of the plane, and keeps things stable while he does the fighting. The FW-15 did a similar thing. It didn't have springs and dampers. Instead, hydraulic actuators controlled by an onboard computer absorbed the bumps and rolls of the fast-moving car. The computer processed information about what the driver was doing and the car's attitude to the road thousands of times a second. This was fed to the actuators that held the car exactly six centimeters above the track at all times. The whole idea was to keep the car as its optimum height above the ground so that it was always producing the maximum amount of downforce. With conventional springs, as soon as you hit the brakes, there's weight transfer forward and the front goes down and the back goes up which changes the balance of the car. And as soon as you pick up the throttle in the middle of the corner, the back goes down and the front comes up, which changes the balance of the car. And if you could have an active suspension system, which was fast enough acting to compensate for that, and also, even more important, held the car, regardless of whether it was a low-speed corner with not much downforce, or a high-speed corner with just a huge amount of downforce, you still had the car optimum height above the ground. That was the objective of the active suspension, and it is worth seconds a lap, not tenths, seconds. Active suspension was banned for the 1994 season. To the engineers, this seemed unfair. Previous bans had been imposed on the grounds of safety. Active suspension, clearly one technical idea that could apply to road cars, was banned because it was a driver aid. I don't think that the active suspension itself um, was a driver aid. It didn't actually drive the car for the driver. It raised the performance potential of the car, but it was a very, very interesting technology which I think could have many commercial uses as well. And I think it was rather a pity that Formula One uh, jumped on that one to uh, limit it. They saw it as restricting the role of the driver and turning the driver into a kind of robot, if you like. I mean, that's an extreme image. So there is an argument of a sort of driver versus technological aids or drivers versus the cutting edge of technology. That's not a simple question because which, which direction do you move in? And the sport is kind of trying to work out where to go between the two. Engineers are so good at making up for lost ground regardless of what limitation is placed on them, that the car would then exceed the speed that the circuit was built for. And that is a given mathematical fact. It would happen. There are corners all around the world that would become unusable if the cars were not controlled in the way they use their wings and the aerodynamics and the power of the engine and the traction and everything else. Even with no skirts, no turbos and no active suspension, a modern Formula One car can generate enough speed and downforce to easily overcome its own weight. It could race on the roof of a tunnel with ease. The 
restrictiveness of the rules does force one to be ever more creative. Um, it does drive you to think of every single way you can f think of to create, to find a legal loophole in the regulation which you can exploit and make your car quicker. And if it's permitted, everyone else will charge with the same gap as well. So you have to think of somebody el of something else. And that's part of the fun. The minute a racing car hits the road, the designer of that car, the man whose signature's at the bottom, will be thinking like an artist, I want to get on with the next painting or the next car, because I know this isn't right or that isn't right, and if we can get the engine to supply to do this, then I know I can do that. So it's just constant change all the time. And if a car that can defeat gravity is the result, it isn't surprising. The source for most of the technology is aircraft. Think of aerospace. Aerospace is about aerodynamics. It's also about being very creative about materials. Making it as light as possible, making it as strong as possible, making it operate in extreme conditions. That's nothing to do with road car manufacture, really. Likewise, motor racing is exactly like that. You know, how can you make that car as light as possible? As light as possible. And how can you make that suspension at the same time as strong as possible? Hence the whole use of carbon fibre and so on. So those kind of skills around materials, uh, around aerodynamics, is an example of how the industries interact. There are some requirements for a Formula One car that are common with, say, a high-performance fighter aircraft. You, you want very lightweight, high level of structural integrity within a small volume, a very high engine power and systems packed within this very small space, a very high aerodynamic performance, very high aerodynamic efficiency. All these things tend to lead to the design thinking having certain common aspects between the two and in truth some of the materials employed uh, whether they were say aluminium alloys or titaniums and some of the you know bonding and uh, joining techniques and more recently within the last 20 years composites uh, a lot to increase structural integrity reduce weight this is nothing new Racing car design has always stolen ideas from aircraft. And sometimes, aircraft have secretly stolen from cars. From the skirted cars of the late 70s to the active suspension cars of the early 90s, Formula One engineers have become increasingly secretive about their technology. By the time this car was banned in 1993, Formula One drivers had a skilled secret assistant on board, a powerful computer. Everything from the spark that ignited the fuel in the engine to the split-second decision to change gear was controlled by an electronic brain. The parallels to aircraft design were obvious, not just in the winged profile of the modern Formula One car, but in the electronic revolution taking place in the cockpit. Something had to be done. It was decided that all those driver aids should come off because it should, the emphasis should be on the driver's championship. So all the driver aids came off. There was one alternative and that was to uh, say that the FIA would issue standard electronic control units which would be given out for every engine but eventually they decided that the car companies would be frightened away because it would effectively cut across their technology. And for the first time since the 1930s, the car companies were coming back to Formula One. Precisely because of its high-tech profile. And the powerful auto giants know the lessons of history. Technology will always win. Aircraft and reliable cars were born at the beginning of the 20th century. By the time planes looked like this in the 1930s, the same engineers were often working on both. 
men like Richard Shuttleworth saw planes and racing cars as opportunities to develop and share technology. In 1935, he raced a supercharged Alfa Romeo through the murk of an English summer at Castle Donington. He won the race. Shuttleworth's legacy is a world-famous collection of aircraft. These planes, perhaps the Eurofighters of their day, look quaint now. But at the time, offered inspiration for racing car designers. In the aircraft industry, because um, strength plus flexibility, um, there's a very high premium on those qualities. Then again, there was a powerful synergy with motor racing because you wanted to make the car as light as possible and as strong as possible. The synergy was everywhere. Whenever old racing cars are dusted off and gathered together, the ghosts of aeroplanes come too. Car cockpits bear a striking resemblance to cockpits of aircraft. Large ducted radiators. Cooled high performance engines. Big bore exhausts look at home on a Hawker Nimrod and a Maserati. Spoked wheels offered lightness and strength on both. Streamlining smoothed air round undercarriages and was famously applied to cars. Even details like wire locking nuts to prevent loosening through vibration was common. For on-the-spot maintenance and repair, quick-release fastenings held on riveted aluminium skins. Wing struts on this 1931 Avro Tutor biplane are aerodynamically profiled like the suspension struts on a Williams racing car, built 60 years later. Most important of all, aviation was an object lesson to motor racing in showing how to pack large high-performance engines into confined spaces. Aircraft designers search out anything that can do a job better. In 1934, Wood offered a small weight advantage, and a Havilland aircraft took it. But it was the shape that pointed to the future. Three de Havilland Comets were built for the England to Australia air race. This is the plane that won the race, Grosvenor House. The narrow fuselage contained three huge fuel tanks. Behind these sat the pilot and co-pilot, one behind the other. It had two small, highly tuned six-cylinder engines. This combination of small engines, streamlined fuselage, and clever details like retractable wheels meant it could cruise close to its top speed of 380 kilometers an hour. The theme would reappear five years later as World War II's fastest bomber, the Mosquito. For the Germans, the development of aircraft engines had been forbidden since 1919. In a reverse of the normal situation, where aircraft technology finds its way into racing cars, the German racing cars helped to keep engine technology up to date. In 1937, Messerschmitts were fitted with Daimler-Benz 12-cylinder supercharged engines. A little later, direct fuel injection was added. The parallels with racing car engines were obvious. 
Less than a decade after the end of the war, Mercedes-Benz was back in racing. Their W196 was almost unbeatable. Direct fuel injection on an eight-cylinder engine had clear aircraft origins. Ten years earlier, there was another make of car racing for Nazi Germany. The auto union was very different. Its designer, Ferdinand Porsche, was convinced that moving the engine behind the driver was a better layout for a racing car. Auto unions first appeared in 1934. They were unique. The fuel tank sat between the driver and the supercharged 16-cylinder engine. A tubular frame also carried coolants from the radiator at the front to the engine at the rear. The Spartan cockpit owed everything to aircraft design of the time. By 1937, Grand Prix racing, dominated by the German factory teams, was heading towards speeds of 320 kilometers an hour. New rules limiting the cars to a maximum weight of 750 kilograms were imposed to stop this. It was supposed to limit the size and power of engines. But the development of high strength lightweight alloys, better streamlining and smaller components meant the restrictions had little effect. Mercedes-Benz benefited most. Porsche's cars had built-in problems. The revolutionary suspension and tall, heavy engines made his cars fearsomely difficult to handle. The futuristic engine-behind-the-driver idea would be neglected for almost 20 years. Nineteen fifty one. Up and coming young drivers mingle with more experienced old hands and autograph hunters. All day, teams arrive at an old airfield called Silverstone for the British Grand Prix. The cars now conform to regulations known as Formula One. All of the competing cars now have engines conventionally mounted at the front. It was rather shambolic um, sport for primarily for wealthy amateurs. Uh, and they were enjoying themselves and there was no discipline, there was comparatively little organization. Uh, the lack of safety when you look back was absolutely frightening. The engine was in front of the car, the driver wore a t-shirt and a linen helmet and cotton trousers, he had no safety belts. Um, there were no gravel traps, there was no arm co. And there were over 100,000 people at Silverstone for the first Grand Prix after the war and just a piece of rope between them and the cars and it's a miracle that there weren't mass fatalities. The spectators behind the ropes were unlikely to see a yellow car win a Grand Prix. In the races of the early 1950s, red cars, the traditional racing colour of Italy, had the best engines and won the most races. The dominance of Italy and Ferrari and Maserati in the 1950s was associated with the engine and the position of the engine at the front of the car. And that's how Formula One was in the 1950s. Except for one guy. There was one guy, John Cooper, who put his engine at the back. And that wasn't in Formula One, that was in Formula Three, which were these funny little cars, engine at the back, motorbike engine. And no one would have guessed then that that was the future. The future of post-war Formula One started in 1947 in the back of a garage in the London suburb of Surbiton. Engineer John Cooper, seen here in the middle, designed and built cars for the aptly named poor man's racing formula, Formula 3. His recipe for a racing car involved welding the front ends of two scrap Fiat 500s together, then adding some tubes. 
Cooper put the engine behind the driver for the simple reason that in Formula 3, power was transmitted from motorcycle engines by chain. And the shorter the chain to the rear wheels, the better. With the weight of the engine and the driver equally distributed between the wheels, his cars were inherently well balanced. John Cooper's cars did a roaring trade among amateur drivers, wanting something cheap and reliable at the weekends. He was an engineer, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew the benefits of putting the engine where he did. I'm sure he'd seen the Auto Union and the very few other rear engine racing cars that there had been before the war, uh, and thought that he could do it better. Monaco, for the first Grand Prix of the season in Europe. The big names of motor racing line up to take their measure for the season. Now second. By 1958, Cooper was doing better. His ideas developed into Formula 2 cars, and then Formula 1. Despite having less horsepower than the competition, the Coopers had better balance and could corner faster, and were beginning to worry the Italians. The duel for supremacy is fought out in grim earnest. Little by little, Cooper had finished the job that Porsche had started, with his pre-war rear-engined auto unions. You couldn't catch Jack Brabham showing the form for the season by winning in the Cooper climate. Within a handful of years, uh, Cooper got into Formula One with a, you know, half an engine really in terms of power, but the formula was so much superior to the front engine. So Colin Chapman, the most creative engineer probably of Formula One in the second half of the 20th century, copied him for the Lotus. Jim Clark would win his first world championship in Chapman's revolutionary Lotus 25 in 1963. Chapman was a pilot. As well as inspiration from Cooper, he borrowed liberally from aviation. The 25 chassis had a monocoque construction. The driver was now almost lying down in the car, lowering its centre of gravity and improving the aerodynamic airflow. Weight was saved by using the engine and gearbox as mounting points for the rear suspension. The Lotus 25 cemented Britain's growing dominance of Formula One. By the late 50s, early 60s, Ferrari had copied. You couldn't go into Formula One unless you had an engine at the back because it completely transformed the weight, the handling characteristics, the aerodynamics, everything. It was a new type of car. The next new car, or rather its engine, arrived in 1967. Chapman and engine designer Keith Duckworth made the engine part of the car's load-bearing structure by bolting it directly to the back of the monocoque. Let's see if it all goes together now. Come on. Oh, right. dear me. Steady. Steady. Down a bit. Uh, Take it down. Very good. Yeah, that's fitting well. Beautiful. Yep, that's the job. Lovely. The engine was the main structure of the, of the car. And that was classic aircraft structure, and the whole uh, style that was carried over onto the Lotus 49 was straight from the aircraft industry. By 1967, all the teams had the engine Cooper style behind the driver. The Italian Ferraris and the early Honda-powered cars had seen the future. But Chapman's new innovation of using the engine as a stressed part of the car's construction was unbeatable. The championship was his. The emphasis was now moving away from the track. 
A game of technological cat and mouse developed as Formula One rule makers try to catch the engineers. Cars with six wheels, this is the Ford powered Tyrrell, try to reduce the drag from big tires. Bernie Eccleston's Brabham, plagued with an underpowered Alfa Romeo engine, found a winning way by using a fan to stick the car onto the road in corners. A sort of hovercraft in reverse. It had one outing, won the race, and was banned. Fascinating as it was, this battle behind the closed doors of the team's increasingly secret factories could only lead to one thing. It's very obvious now that cars could be built that wouldn't need a driver at all. You can, you can program the cars to do everything. And anything you can't program into the car, you can do from the pits with you know, dials and buttons and hand controllers. But nobody would go to watch that. Since the earliest days of the 20th century, aircraft shared their technology with racing cars. Slowly, then with increasing speed, cars for the track have become less like road cars and more like aircraft. And certainly what I'm looking at is, is probably more close to an aircraft fuselage than it is anything that somebody would drive along the street in. I've always thought that if this was 1942, Patrick Head would be the sort of guy at the forefront of the development of the Spitfire and the Hurricane. I imagine they were the sorts of engineers who were pushing those extremes at that moment. Today's Spitfire is a technological free-for-all. It is packed with electronic systems. Systems which are already revolutionizing road cars. There's absolutely no reason why Formula One shouldn't be a technological free-for-all. It's just my concern that it doesn't seem to be quite clear in its own mind what it should be. You can't uninvent things that have already been invented. So you've got to embrace technology. The question is how far do you take it? It is not untrue to say that nowadays they could, they could put things on cars and program them to go around the circuits by themselves. They, they wouldn't need a driver at all. But that's not what motor racing is about. It's a combination of man and machine. In planes, man and machine are locked together by electronics. The future of aircraft control is not muscle power or skill. It is a conversation. Display engines, hide, stores, das, head down, stores, freaks. In the modern battle space, there's so much information out there and the sensors on board the airplane can pick all that up. It would be very, very easy uh, for that information to overload the pilot unless you filter it by way of computers and give him a picture in the cockpit that he can deal with. He's, he's useless in that fighting platform. Top drivers have always been able to cope with information overload. Formula One engineers are already removing it. Since the start of 2002, electronic traction control, or TC, has been legal on Formula One cars. Traction control turned off means this is possible. Switched on, TC doesn't make cars faster, it just makes driving easier. You say, okay, I'm going to do one lap with the TC on, one lap with the TC off. Let's see if my right foot is better than the TC. For sure, for one lap, you can do as quick as the TC. But over a race distance, allows you to concentrate on other things. It allows you to concentrate on braking. It allows you to, when you exit the corner, you can already start changing settings because you know the car won't spin. That's what technology does. It makes life easier. Nobody wants Formula One 
to retreat from the leading edge of technology, but it's a very, very hard balance to find. Uh, and in, <laughs> there are very good minds within Formula One, and they have to concentrate on, I think now, on drawing up a set of regulations that ensure that that balance is sustained.